All right, excellent. So our next presenting company is Caladrius, and here to present for the company is Dave Mazzo, CEO. Dave, great to have you uh, with us today. Um, and if there are any questions from the audience, don't hesitate to ask. We'd love to have, um, have this be more interactive. So I'm going to start. Um, Bob Peretti, who is the president of this, organi of this esteemed organization, um, hosting the event today. Um, um, Bob was obviously works at PCT, and Hitachi just recently acquired this division from Caladrius, a uh, very well-known cell manufacturing um, unit. Maybe you can walk us through the rationale behind this deal, why it made sense. I believe there was a two-tranched two um, uh, transaction, so maybe you can start off by uh, picking up where Bob left off first thing this morning. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you again for the opportunity, and thanks for everyone hanging around so late in the day. Um, the the transaction actually transpired based upon an opportunity that ultimately became apparent over time as we looked at the combination, what we thought initially was an intuitive combination of a cell therapy manufacturing development uh, arm and a therapeutic development arm. We realized that over time as both of these two companion businesses grew, they both became large consumers of capital and they consumed capital at rates that were differing. They had different risk profiles. They had different returns on investment and different timelines for success. And that made raising money with investors difficult because it was typical, typical for investors not to be able to categorize us. So even though we had what we considered a best-in-class CDMO and a very exciting therapeutic program, Investors typically liked one or the other, and as a result, didn't make any investments. For that reason, we have been looking for the last several years at a mechanism by which we could satisfy the need to become more focused or pure play. When we looked at the first conversations over a year ago with Hitachi to bring on a minority shareholder, the idea was basically to give us an opportunity to have a, a, an avenue or a vehicle for global expansion. So we needed to expand outside of the United States. Uh, Japan has got great regenerative medicine regulatory environment and laws, and it seemed like a, a likely place, and Hitachi was anxious to get into the business. We developed a close working relationship with them, and as a result, they became a minority shareholder in uh, 2016. And at the time, the strategy was clearly to continue to build on that platform of US plus Japan, and even potentially at some point expand into, into Europe. What transpired over the course of last year was a competitive environment for PCT that rapidly became um, you know, threatening. We have some very big players who have decided to make um, major capital investments and to move into the area. And also as companies like Kite and others move toward commercialization, it gave many of our clients the idea that in order to be a viable clinical partner, we needed to demonstrate today the capacity to be a commercial partner. That was another major investment step that we couldn't take as, as Caladrius. And so we began the discussion with our partner Hitachi about mechanisms by which we could feed all of our children. And ultimately the proposal came about that said that you know, if we could find a mechanism by which we could, we Caladrius could maintain an active relationship with PCT. They could still be a close partner and in fact provide us with some of the preferred status that we enjoyed as an owner and could collect a bowl of capital to then properly fund the therapeutics business. It would be a win for everyone and that's in fact what has now transpired. Well, absolutely. Congratulations because you brought in over $100 million for that. This really leaves Caladrius as a well-funded pure play cell therapy company. So the company's lead program now is CLBS03 to treat type 1 diabetes. Dave, can you tell us about the mechanism of action of these autoimmune regulatory cells that you're developing? Yes, Ted. So you know, we're taking an approach that actually it's, this is a perfect follow-on to the, the SEMA presentation because in our corporate presentation we have a slide that shows where we fit into the paradigm of development. On the, on the one end, you have many companies working to provide uh, insulin, long-term insulin therapies, insulin analogs, and those are typically many big pharma companies, and that's chronic therapy. On the other end, you have something like what our colleagues from SEMA were talking about, which could be you know, sort of a, a regenerative approach to, to a cure. 
And, and, and in the middle, you have what we're approaching, which is a mechanism by which we believe we can attack the disease at its earliest stages, prevent progression, and provide the patient with an insulin-sparing or insulin-free life for a sufficient amount of time such that the innovations of companies like SEMA can actually become a reality. Interesting. So tell us about these cells specifically that you're using and how do they work? So we're, we've taken the approach that's been uh, developed by uh, Professor Jeff Bluestone at UCSF, that's the, 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 the licensed technology that we hold in this area, whereby we're essentially leveraging you know, roughly two millennia of human evolution to try to rebalance the native state of an individual's immune system. In type 1 diabetes, typically there is an insufficient number of insufficiently active T regulatory cells, and the T effector cells in the body are attacking the beta cells and, and causing the disease to progress. Our approach is to return to its natural state in that patient the balance by supplementing that patient's polyclonal autologous cells with ex vivo expanded T regulatory cells from that patient, restore the balance, and eliminate or even uh, rather reduce or even eliminate the symptoms of the disease. Great, that's helpful. Now, you also received a grant from California Institute for Regenerative Medicine um, and receiving funding. Um, from other groups as well. So maybe you can tell us about how these deals have helped offset both preclinical and now uh, clinical expense of the program. Yeah, so um, first of all, there are no longer any, any preclinical expenses associated to the program per se, but the, uh, the clinical program is essentially now, uh, at least the remaining costs, covered through the external you know, non-dilutive funding. The generosity of CIRM, of Sanford Research Foundation, uh, of JDRF, and, and others has really helped us offset significantly. And so we're applying very little of our current capital to the completion of this ongoing phase two trial. Great, so you brought up the phase two. Maybe we can jump into the details. I believe there's two in interim analysis with this. So walk us through the trial design and when we could see data. So the trial design, we believe, we, we like to characterize it as a landmark study because it, in our opinion, it's the first controlled study that's been done to test these cells in, in a proper uh, population. So it is randomized, placebo-controlled, targeting two different doses of cells in the target population of recently diagnosed adolescents with the standard regulatory and medical endpoints. There, it's a power to see a meaningful clinical difference over time in those endpoints, including uh, C-peptide stabilization, uh, hemoglobin A1C, hypoglycemic episodes, insulin utilization, et cetera. It is constructed to have 111 patients in three different cohorts, one being placebo. There was an interim safety analysis that took place after the first 19 patients were dosed and had a one-month follow-up. The DSMB gave us a green light to go forward. Those, all of those patients have now passed their six-month follow-up and their safety uh, profile remains clean. We are now dosing the second cohort of patients, and we expect to have that uh, completed by the end of this year, perhaps a little bit sooner. When we dose the 55th patient in the program, which should come during the late second quarter, we'll start a six-month clock toward a prescribed interim analysis of therapeutic effect, safety, and a vast per, uh, panel of biomarkers. And we should have that data by late 2017 and be able to discuss it publicly in early 2018. The one-year primary follow-up will occur at the end of 2018. Great, that's helpful. So Dave, just thinking about this mechanism of restoring balance to the immune system, put you know in very general terms, it's very broadly applicable to a lot of different diseases. So what other indications are you thinking about pursuing, especially considering that the type 1 diabetes phase 2 trial is largely offset and, and it's not all of your money going to pay for that? Yeah, we, 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 you're right. There's a very long list of autoimmune diseases that could potentially benefit from this particular trial. What we've looked at is a, you know, an analysis of, of, of most of those diseases trying to identify those that have either 
hard endpoints or well-defined, validated biomarkers for an endpoint where the patient populations are, are, are available so the studies can be enrolled, where the time to an endpoint is reasonable, and where the number of patients to getting to a, a proof of concept would not be outrageous. And, and we've narrowed that down to a number. One of those that's likely to start soon, but I say likely only based upon an ongoing discussion with another non-dilutive uh, grant funder, the Guthy Jackson Foundation, is the autoimmune disease of neuromyelitis optica. And that's a place where we could start a trial, you know, almost any time soon using essentially the identical process that's being employed in the CLBS-03 diabetes trial. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I want to take it back a little bit because a few years back, um, then the company was called Neostem, and they reported what I thought were encouraging heart attack data for, um, I, I believe they were CD, CD34 cells. Mm -hmm. Um, CLBS 20, I think, is what you call this product now. What's the current status of that program? And I think it may have a potential path forward uh, with some of the um, developments that are taking place in Japan. I'm glad you brought that up. The uh, it, it was actually it's CLBS 12, and 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 that program, which was read out as a phase two just before I arrived at the company, um, is characterized by many people as a failed phase two in acute myocardial infarction following STEMI. Um, the study is a failure in the sense that it didn't meet its primary endpoint, which was an endpoint that was designed by um, a non-cardiologist and none of our current uh, staff, and it was an endpoint not recognized by anyone in the cardiology community or the regulatory community. So it was a perfusion based upon a, a a, um, an imaging technique, and the technique didn't have the resolution to see any difference between placebo and active. What has been, I think, missed in, and, and now is published is that all of the hard endpoints that cardiovascular surgeons, interventionalists, and the regulators would want, that is, an effect on mortality, an effect on MACE, an effect on improvement of left, ejection, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, reduction in infarct size, they all were positive. So we believe that this adds to the already pretty large body of evidence that says that CD34 cells can actually have a therapeutic effect in peripheral arterial diseases or cardiovascular diseases. More than 700 patients have been treated with these, uh, these cells in studies of this type. So with that in mind, we have uh, spoken to our colleagues in the regulatory uh, departments in Japan. And we are now about to embark upon a study in critical limb ischemia in Japan which will be a 35 patient open label phase two trial, which has the PMDA's blessing to be uh, qualifying for early conditional approval if successful. And that we think has a very high likelihood of clinical success based upon two published studies in Japan showing effect in, C in CLI and two outside of Japan replicating that, that work. Right. And Dave, I want to finish our conversation. I've been asking most companies about 21st Century Cures Act. So how, how do you think this can help Caladrius in both the type 1 diabetes but also potentially the uh, CLI indications? Well, like many of my colleagues here, we're not exactly sure what the government is ultimately going to you know, apply from that. But you know, if we start with the cardiovascular indication, there, uh, there has been a study that was done by, at the time it was Baxter, looking at CD34 cells and refractory angina. When Baxter turned into Baxalta and ultimately then sold that to Shire, the, the, the refractory angina phase three program that was ongoing got stopped prematurely. And recently that data has actually now been calculated and reported by uh, the cardiologists at Duke. And they showed that it was a positive study even though they never completed enrollment. So we believe that there's a possibility that with the access to that data and an application of some flexibility because of the 21st Century Cures Act that maybe only one additional study might be viable to get an approved indication in refractory angina for that technology. As it relates to diabetes, it's hard to say at this point. It'll depend quite a lot on the magnitude and durability of the effect we show in phase two. Great. Dave, thank you very much for being with us today. Excited to see the company turning around as under your leadership and excited to see where you go from here. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate it.